three, two, one, live. Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us tonight for another Frosty Drew Observatory Summer Stargazing Nights live event. We're doing our live event tonight as a fallback because the weather forecast that we're seeing for tonight, though quite variable, we do think that we're gonna be seeing a lot of fog rolling into the area and potentially clouds. Now, we have a lot of different forecasting sources we use and we formulate an overall forecast based on what everyone else is saying. And one of our most reputable sources has been predicting clear skies all week. And for most of the Rhode Island and Southern New England area, they were right, except for here. That cloud deck that's been sitting off the south has been really hammering us and we're afraid that the same thing may happen again tonight. Now, this is the last week we're gonna do this. Next week, we're gonna start opening on Friday nights, regardless of weather, unless it's raining or like a hurricane or something like that. And what we'll do is we're gonna allow up to 45 people to visit using a ticket system facilitated through our website. And that's gonna become, the, the, the number, that number's gonna grow as time moves on. And eventually we'll be able to remove all these restrictions as we move through the summer, hopefully the sooner the better. Now, tonight we have a few people on and I wanna introduce some of our team. So you have myself, Scott McNeil, and I'm down here actually at Frosty Drew Observatory right now. You can see the primary telescope right here. I'm up on the observer's platform and I have the telescope pointed at the sky though it is still daytime. So there's nothing to see here yet. We also have Derek Schott coming in from Connecticut tonight. Derek's gonna be, has been showing us a lot of really great work he's been doing. He's gonna show us a lot more tonight. We have Gavin Olson coming to us from Connecticut tonight as well. And these are all of our astronomers on, on tonight. We also have two moderators. We have Jessica and we have Lindsay. And then we also have our new intern for summer 2020, Mara. This Cesara is on tonight with us. And you'll be seeing a lot of her this summer during the public nights, during live streams, and you'll be seeing a lot of her work as well. So everyone keep an eye out for Mara. She really is an awesome person. So as we go tonight, we're gonna try to get you live views if we can. And I'm gonna try to do it through the big telescope down here at Frosty Drew, but we're, we're talking summer solstice is tomorrow. And that puts us at the latest sunset times for the year. Astronomical twilight tonight ends just after 10.30, which is gonna make it very difficult for us to actually get a dark sky view for you. Now, the reason we're not starting at 10 o'clock tonight is because we want you guys to actually tune in and be able to catch what we're doing. Now, just a quick note about that. Tomorrow is the summer solstice. It's happening at about 5.43 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And what the summer solstice is, it's when the Earth reaches a point in its orbit where the Northern Hemisphere is tilted at maximum tilt, 23.4 degrees to, towards the sun. It marks the first day of summer in the Northern Hemisphere. It also marks the four, first day of winter in the Southern Hemisphere. And it gives us those short periods of night. Tomorrow we'll have a, just a little bit over four and a half hours of darkness tomorrow night. And that's something we have to struggle with as astronomers. So tomorrow, you know, wh whether you like all that heat loving zealotry or not, step outside, 543, high five the sky and welcome to summer solstice, right? So I believe we might have a few questions that have come in and Jessica's gonna read off some questions for us. Hey, James. All right, so we had a question from Ken um, about a comet and he said, a comet with 7,000 year orbit, what propels it to come our way? What creates the orbital path? What allows it to leave the sun's gravity and return on its orbit? So I guess that's more like three questions in one. Yeah, that's way more than one question, Ken. What's going on here? No, that's cool. So the, the, the comet with this, this, the comet currently with a 7,000 year orbit, that sounds to me like it's comet U6 you're talking about, comet Lemon. And so the comet Lemon, or in this case, any comet with a 7,000 year orbital period is what we consider a long period comet. A long period comet is any comet with an orbital period longer than 200 years. Now, what causes the comet to follow a path like that? So when you're talking long period comets, most of these comets, they come from the Oort cloud. 
And the Oort cloud is the very edge of the solar system's boundary. And it resides at about one light year in radius. Now, all these comets or Oort cloud objects that sit in the Oort cloud are all leftover material from the formation of the solar system. Kind of like this really big time capsule that surrounds us, a very old material. And events on other stars that are close to us, like a coronal mass ejection. You know, coronal mass ejection is when you have a plasma and magnetism like burst on the sun that pushes against the corona and then releases some of that corona material, which is plasma and mag magnetized plasma, into the solar wind. And anything that it kind of gets in touch with will give a little bit of a push. Now, in the Oort cloud, you're outside of the sun's dominant field of interaction is a good way to put it. So the heliosphere ends way before the Oort cloud. When you're inside the heliosphere, the sun is the, is the magnetic master. And everything that happens inside the heliosphere is governed by the sun. Outside the heliosphere, you start getting plasma from other stars that become almost as frequent as plasma from the sun. So when you're in the Oort cloud, you could end up receiving a coronal mass ejection from say Alpha Centauri or from Sirius or from Wolf 359, some of the closest stars to us. And that could give us a little tiny push on some of these objects that are in the Oort cloud. And it could allow them to just swing in close enough to start to drop into the sun's gravity well. So that's what, call, that's, that's what starts it. Now the comets will, it depends on the, the direction that they're pushed in. It depends on where they are in the Oort cloud. Not, it's not like inside the inner solar system where everything is on the plane of the, of the sun's equator, which is called the ecliptic. These objects could be coming over top, they could be spinning around, they could be underneath, and it depends on the direction that that CME comes from. And it will push that comet into what we call an inclined orbit. So it could be anywhere from zero degrees inclined, which means it's following the plane of the solar system along the ecliptic, or it could come in at, at 90 degrees inclined or even furthermore. So it depends on where that CME originated from or whatever gave a push on that Oort cloud object and where that object was in the Oort cloud. And that governs the inclination of its orbit. Now, the reason the comet, now you said comet breaking the uh, sun's gravity. So the comet doesn't break the sun's gravity. Even in the Oort cloud, they are still in the sun's gravity and that's why they're in the Oort cloud. Now, what's happening is, is when these comets come in, they do speed up a lot as they go around the sun. And then after they leave the sun, they slow down because they have a drag now from gravity pulling back in. And it's not enough speed necessarily for these comets to slingshot out. So what happens is, is as a comet goes around the sun, it speeds up really fast, it loses some mass as well, and then it gets shot back out and it starts to slow down as it gets back out towards the Kuiper belt, and out towards the scattered disk. And then as it gets back to the Oort cloud, it slows down nicely. But now it maintains an orbital path. It doesn't just go back in the Oort cloud and wait for another push. It's now on an orbital period, which means it will go back almost out to the Oort cloud and swing all the way around and come back in 7,000 years later. And so the comets never break gravity with the sun. The only thing that will stop a comet generally from continuing its orbital period is if the comet breaks apart during its perihelion period. And perihelion period is when it's the closest towards the sun and it is subjected to full out solar radiation, a real onslaught. So that is the answer to those questions. Excellent questions, Ken. So and do we have any seen, other questions, Jess, or? Go ahead, we've, Derek, go we've ahead. Seen, we've seen several comets break up this year, unfortunately. Um, so we, you know, yeah. we've seen that example happen. And uh, we haven't gotten to see an awesome comet survive. <laughs> I was, I throw. wrote in, in today's le newsletter, I wrote that I feel like 2020 is going to be known as the year of the failed comets. And I think that might be a little pretentious considering all the things that are happening in 2020, you know, COVID-19, the uh, a very, very charged election year and the failure of numerous comets. But for me, it is definitely going to be the year that we had all these amazing comets that all just failed. But we do have two comets right now that could still score. I mean, I, I believe at this point that we may not want to get too excited because of the, we've already had three comets fail on us this year. But we have comet U6, 
Comet U6 had perihelion happen yesterday. So yesterday it was as close as day to the sun. And from my, I haven't looked very closely at the data, but from what I have seen, it looks like it's, so far it has survived perihelion. And if it did, that means we're gonna, over the month of July, we could get a pretty good view of it in the sky. Now, that inclination again, Comet um, U6 came at us from underneath the sun, came up over the top, and then, I think, no, actually, I think it came from above, and then it's went underneath and it's coming back up. But it's going to pass us on the opposite side of Earth and the sun, which, and the tail always points away from the sun. So from our point of view, the tail is going to be obscured by the comet's big atmosphere that forms around. It's called a coma. So what we'll just see is a bright ball in the sky if it becomes naked eye visible. Now, comet F3, Neowise, that's the new one to the block. That's another big riser right now that had a nice outburst. It's becoming quite visible. It's magnitude 7.3 right now, which is a bit dimmer than naked eye, but easily visible to binoculars. That comet's going to hit perihelion on July 3rd. And after perihelion, it's, so it came in kind of underneath us, and it's sharply swinging around the sun. We're talking really close perihelion, almost a sun grazer. About, I think it's roughly four, 4 million miles. I'm not too sure from the sun. It's pretty close. And then as it swings back out, it's going to come over top of us on a very sharp angle. And it's going to pass us, I think, on July 27th or July 23rd, sometime around that period. But that is awesome because sun grazers are comets get really close to the sun. They experience intense outgassing, which forms in a massive tail behind this, in front of this comet as it leaves. And the angle that we would be able to see this comet in the night sky is perfect for spotting that tail. So this month, the comet U6 might be really awesome. Comet F3, if that survives, that's going to be the real winner. Okay. Fingers crossed. So if there's fingers no other crossed. questions to start with, and go ahead, Derek. I just said fingers crossed. Yeah, I know. I, I've, I've been crossing my fingers, and it hasn't been helping. We good, Jess, with questions? Yeah, so far. All right, I'm going to throw up some images. So what we did is we finished off our... So we've been, if you guys have noticed over the last few months of doing these live events, we had a lot of Venus stuff that we were showing. And it's because we spent a lot of time this year, well, myself up at, with Brown University, doing a lot of work on Venus. And we were trying to track, so we were collecting data for the, the labs is what we were doing. And a secondary project we were doing was trying to really track Venus's progress as it went through what we call eastern elongation, which is on the, when it's on the eastern side of the sky from the sun, and then as it approached inferior conjunction, which is when it ends up in between the Earth and the sun. Now, inferior conjunction happened on June 3rd, and we did pretty good getting up to that point. We did end up having a lot of cloudy days right around perihelion, or I'm sorry, inferior conjunction, but we were able to get pretty close to it. So I'm gonna show you the very last images that we captured, including the entire uh, sequence image of that span. So right here is, we'll go to screen, entire screen, all right, we'll try that. Um, and Hang on. Can you see my screen, Derek? Cannot. Cannot. All right. So I'm having a little trouble presenting at the minute, the moment. Derek, did you want to switch over real quick with something? Yeah, we can go through um, the stuff I've put together for tonight. See what happens. Yeah, do that. Just uh, do a couple things, and we'll switch back. Just give me a minute to... See what's going on with my screen yeah. thing. All right, let's see. Yes. Okay, um, so uh, early last month, um, a galaxy in the Virgo cluster experienced um, a type two supernova um, that was detected and has started to be categorized 
Um, and right is about the time I found out about it, uh, we were starting to get into the full moon. Um, and the night I went out to go take a picture of this back in May, the moon was about, I don't know, five degrees from this galaxy. And the picture just turned to be a, a washout of the moon. Um, so after the moon went, um, you know, and did its thing, became full, and then went back to third quarter, uh, I was able to get out and take a picture of M61 uh, to see the, the supernova. Um, so all of the stars in this image um, are member stars of the Milky Way galaxy. And this, um, these like half crosshairs that are pointing to this dot here in the middle um, are pointing to the supernova. And that is a star that is going through the end stages of a star's life in the M61 galaxy. And as you can see, is basically outshining the entire galaxy. Um, this particular supernova is uh, a type two supernova, which means that it is due to uh, the collapse of a star after it has burned through most of its primary fuel and has fused enough iron to cool the core and it now collapsed in on itself going and open tonight goes through a um, runaway reaction and creates this light that we see over there um, over in the back over here the other type of supernova is a type one um, and that usually has a very strong peak and then it kind of tails off uh, and the light curve you know goes back to normal fairly quickly because it's a, it's a much more rapid and um, intense event. Whereas a type two, the burn is a little slower. This will last um, maybe up to, you know, 80 to 100 days um, at this brightness. And then it'll tail back off as the, the fuel from that collapse event is burned through. So Derek, that's quite a fabulous a image of that. Are we expecting to see a supernova in M61, or did this just kind of happen? I think this one just kind of happened. Um, a couple of the articles that I read, um, a lot of it, this was basically happened right at the end of kind of what is in amateur astronomy called galaxy season. Um, this galaxy is right behind Leo uh, in the constellation Virgo, and it's to the right of Bootes, and it's un underneath um, you know, Coma Bersini's. And it's underneath, like the or south of the Markovian, or I can never say that Markarian. one. Markarian. Markarian's chain, Mark yeah. Um, and I had spent a lot of time this this year taking images in that area of the sky. And then the night I found out about this, I was like, oh, I can do it tomorrow night. And the moon was like five, you know, five degrees away, and it was just way too bright. Uh, and then, in, you know, two or three days later, when the moon was even brighter, the sky just wasn't working out. And the other neat thing you can see in this picture is below and to the right and below and to the left, there's two uh, background galaxies uh, in here as well. And I've been taking more data on this one um, over the last couple of days, and I'm going to try and plot some of the light curve and see if, I, if my equipment can actually do that, which is kind of a, a fun experiment for me. The, what's, I mean, that's, what's awesome about this supernova, too, is that that's a, quite a bright view that you have of it right there. I mean, not only do you have, like it, it's, it's quite clear. And that's definitely a score. Now, have you, have you been, how many times have you imaged this so far, Derek? Four nights. Have you seen a difference in brightness at all? No, I mean, I've only, uh, the four nights were over a five night period. I, only, I missed one night in between uh, two of the imaging sessions. So, like, visually, I, there's no indication that it's gotten dimmer. Um, I'm going to see if in a month I can notice a difference visually. But I'm poking around on the web to see if I can find some tooling that actually allows you to measure the stars. Like, it'll use some of the other stars in the image as a calibration source. And then at there's, least that's reading about. <laughs> check, check out the, the AAVSO, the Variable Star Organization. They have a light curve generator that's pretty good. Okay. Um, sounds good. I'll have to poke around and see if I can find that. That's the one that we use for a lot of our supernova stuff. But okay. these supernovae too, like as, as Gavin was saying earlier, like we don't know when they're going to happen, especially these, these are supernova in other galaxies, like extragalactic supernovae. 
And what happens is you're looking at an object that from our point of view doesn't ever change. The evolution of a galaxy on the scale of humanity's existence is pretty much non-changing. But now all of a sudden you get another star appears. Now when you're looking around Derek's field here, I'm not sure if you already mentioned this, but all these other stars you see, these are just in the Milky Way galaxy. They just happen to be along the same path that we're looking to look at the Messier 61 galaxy. But that spot that he has annotated there, that little star, that's actually in that galaxy. And this supernova is so intense and so bright that it's outshining almost everything else in the galaxy aside from just a galactic nucleus. I mean, it's, these are amazing events. And we see them in other galaxies all the time, and we do see them occasionally in the Milky Way. We're se severely overdue an event like this in the Milky Way, and that would be really awesome if we were to actually get one of these that would happen. Oh, man, that's going to be... Uh... That would be so fun. Yeah, I mean, if that happened, we wouldn't need nighttime to see it, right? We see it during the daytime. Yeah. I mean, that would be awesome. It's excellent summer solstice object if it wasn't set. <laughs> yeah, just take a picture of the night of the day sky. You'll still see it. Um, so the next one I've got is, um, so this, this galaxy is, like I said, behind Leo, um, to, to the east of Leo. And then we're going to go look at two galaxies that are off the end of the Big Dipper's handle. Um, the first one is going to be M51. Um, so this one's actually cropped. Um, this is data from a couple different nights, and I had to crop it because I didn't have the telescope perfectly lined up between imaging nights. Um, I've since figured out how to align that better, so I don't have to crop them, but the data sets transpired that learning event or yeah um so this one's pretty neat um this is this is basically a galactic interaction going on you've got the the main component uh m51 the whirlpool galaxy and then you have this galaxy down here that has interacted and you know materials been stripped away it's been disturbed and then you have this this arm of material that goes back to m51 um that kind of forms this bridge and then the thing I'm trying to pull out in this image that I, I think I need more data for is there's this very large gas halo around this um, galaxy here um, that is, you know, many, many times larger than the actual illuminated part of that galaxy um, component. And this is kind of like a face on view of what happens when two galaxies interact with each other. Um, you get, you know, this one basically completely destroyed and because M51 was so much larger, most of its structure survived, um, though it does appear that some of it isn't quite 100%. Um, you can see this might be a little bulged out. Uh, and this kind of seems a little weird. Uh, when you look at a classic um, spiral galaxy that hasn't been disturbed. And then you've got these, you know, great dust lanes that go along uh, the, the the arms of the galaxy, and then this one on the outer edge here. So this this one, if you're looking at the Big Dipper, the handle, um, as the handle kind of curves over towards Arcturus, um, if you drew a line between the end of the Big Dipper's handle and Arcturus, and then 90 degrees perpendicular to that line, go, you know, basically the distance. Um, that you would have to go back to the, the next, the, the second star in the handle. Um, it's, it's not super close to the end, the, the end star in the handle, but it's pretty close. Um, and then going the other way, um, off of that same star, uh, basically the same distance, you've got M101. Um, this is the pinwheel galaxy and it is a much larger, I guess, uh, going back to this previous picture, this one's cropped. Um, this is about a third of the frame. And then this one is the full frame of the camera. And this is a much, much larger galaxy. I think this one's about 140,000 light years across. 
Uh, comparing that to the Milky Way, it's about twice as big. The Milky Way is between 60 and 70,000 light years across. And you can really see the spiral structures in this one. Um, I, I lose this object to the trees very quickly, so I don't get to get I don't get a lot of data on it each night, which is why I've kind of pushed things a little hard, and it's pretty grainy because I don't have as much data as I want, but I want to I want to show the detail. So you you can see the dust lanes in this this galaxy um, are you know pretty well defined, and you've got um, star forming regions um, off the end of these galactic arms and they, they continue all the way over here. Um, so this one's a, a pretty awesome face on view of uh, what a spiral galaxy would look like um, undisturbed. That's an excellent and, image, Derek. And you I mean, can it's see very that, sharp yeah. too. Yeah, I was I was really working on uh, making sure I had, you know, like good focus, good tracking. And it seems to be working out just to figure that out. And you can see I had a satellite go through the image here. That's what this straight line is. So didn't take it out in the final set, but it'll come out once I get enough data to make a final image. Um, so that's three galaxies. Um, we're going to jump over to the summer triangle area. Um, this the summer triangle is an asterism made up of three constellations, Lyra, Cygnus, and um, I'm going to forget the third one. Altair's the star. Anyway, I'll think of it in a minute. Um, so the ring that is in the consoles and liar. Can we mute Scott? I think only Scott can mute himself. It sounds like there is people who are trying to come in. All right, Scott's been muted. Oh, good. All right, so um, back to that. So in um, in the constellation of Lyra, um, there's kind of a trapezoid underneath the Vega, and the two stars farthest away from Vega, about halfway in between, is this really um, is this object that known as the ring, and it's known as the ring because it, it is basically you know a ring shape. And when you look at it with a telescope, it looks like a little smoke ring in, in space, and it's basically a ring. Um, this is the result of a star dying. Um, it basically, you know, expels a lot of gas um, as the star, you know, ends its cycle of burning hydrogen to, you know, form light um, and heat. And what ends up happening is that material just makes a bubble around the star. This star didn't go nova. It didn't go supernova. It, w it didn't have enough mass to do any of that. That's um, what I it, was just going to ask you that question. It, was it a low mass star? Like, does that, right. is that what happens to like our sun, for yeah. example? So this, for that this sun? would basically be the end result of our sun at the end of its life after it's gone through its red giant stage. Um, and then it expels all of the gaseous material that it can and then you're left with this very small, if you notice right in the middle, I'm going to zoom in, um, you've got this very uh, pinpoint in the middle, and that's the dwarf star that remains, the, the core of material that couldn't be expelled, um, and that stays and eventually cools down, and you know that's the end of that star's life. Do you know about um, how long it'll stay looking like that for? Um, this so this object, you know, it'll probably be a couple million years um, that this structure will remain. Um, this because this one is basically off on its own. Um, I, I would imagine it'll stay. It'll 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 continue to grow. The, the material is still moving outwards from the star um, until it interacts with something. Um, maybe another nearby star will you know end its life, and the material will. Uh, the, the material will collide, and at that collision point, you could have some interaction that starts producing stars again. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, right? Yeah, it's it's a very long process, though. Um, so that's one example of a planetary nebula. Um, the next one is another example of a planetary nebula. This is called the Dumbbell Nebula, um, or the Apple Core Nebula. And when you look at this one through a telescope, you primarily see this bright, brighter region. Um, that's in the center, and it looks like two bites out of an apple core, or if you're, you know, if you're looking at a dumbbell, it's kind of the, the two dumbbells. 
Uh, but you can see there's a little bit more structure here on the left and right um, that is just more hydrogen gas that's been expelled into space. Um, I don't actually know which star in the middle here would be the central component if there even is one that's visible. Um, this object is located more within our Milky Way, um, like the plane of our Milky Way. If we go back to the ring, you can kind of see the background stars aren't quite as dense. And then we go to M27, the, the density of the background stars increases quite a bit um, because we're, we're basically looking along the plane of the Milky Way through all of those stars, and there's just more of them to look at. Um, and this, this object is located basically halfway between Altair and Deneb, uh, maybe a little bit closer to Altair than Deneb, um, but it's within the Summer Triangle. So Derek, this, um, you see they're both planetary nebulas, but they're radically different shapes. Is that just a consequence of what angle we're looking at them, or is it something about how they were formed? Um, it could be angle that we're looking at them. Um, from Going back to the ring, from what I've learned about why this looks like a smoke ring, it's because this is, base, this is nearly a perfect bubble. And as you look through the bubble, um, you're looking through more material as you get closer to the edges um, than you are when you're looking through the center of the bubble. Um, just because it's a shell of material. And then M27 might just be that it was a more active event instead of a sudden event or a longer drawn out event. So the gas is more uniformly distributed um, over time, uh, but maybe not in structure. Um, maybe the spin of the star affected where the material went. I, I, I'm not sure I know enough about how planetary nebulas are formed to you know, form a real answer, but those would be kind of my, my suspicions. What was the question? Why is the structure between the ring and the Dumbbell Nebula so drastically different? Okay, so what Derek was saying is, is definitely true. It really depends on what's happening with the event. But in the case of the Ring Nebula, we're looking at the Ring Nebula from a point of view where you have that bubble expanding around it. And this event was not as dramatic as, say, the, as M27, the dumbbell. This event let off that its outer layers of gas as a cloud, or its outer layers of the star as a gas cloud, which then slowly expand out as a bubble. So really, depending on where you look at the ring nebula, it would largely look the same generally. Now, M27, the dumbbell nebula, that was much more catastrophic. And this event, the way this occurred, is you have the star in the center, and then from that star, you have what looks like almost cones of ejected matter coming out each side. So if you were to look at this from, the, uh, uh, the, from a side view, you would see the pinpoint star in the middle, and it would look like butterfly wings on the sides, this pushing outward. Mm. But our view of this, this nebula, this event, is not from, the, from that point of view, from a face-on point of view. We're actually looking straight into one of the cones. So if you were to think about both sides of this object spanning out this way, turn it this way, and you're looking directly into one of those cones. And that's why we see it from this point of view. Okay. Uh, that's pretty cool. Now, I have, uh, if, if you give me one second, Derek, if yeah, you can keep going, but I do have a, a live view here. All right, I got, I've got a couple more after this, um, but we can definitely switch to live views. Yeah, Those I'd say this, because we can split it up a little bit, you know, so. Yeah. But just give me one second here real quick. Before those so clouds come in. Well, if they come in, we'll mm -hmm. see, huh? Let me just, if I could get this right into the center again real quick. Move it this way. One second. So what we're going to do is I have a live view in a big telescope here, and this is a view of the star Albireo. But let me see if I can get this. Show me where I want it to show me. One second. All right, 
right, let's see here. Everyone's waiting with bated breath. Yeah, um, <laughs> for some reason it's it's swung out of the field and I can't seem to get it back into the field for some, I don't know why. So <laughs> that is the that is always what happens. But it's not it's not the telescope. It in this case, it's the software I'm using to actually run the live view in the hmm. telescope. So I'm gonna can dark table. I'm gonna say it too. Dark table, not working. I'm gonna reload it and see if now it's gonna play nice, right? That's the dream. Come on, Junior, let's go. I did find a good use for um, cloudy nights though. Taking dark. What's that? Taking dark. Yeah, well, if you get your temperature right, huh? Yeah, well, that's why you... Precision control with that fancy new Precision camera. control, that's right. Okay. All right, here we go. Mosquito. Dead. <laughs> is it now? Window. This, is, this is how it goes with telescopes. If anybody's interested, after you get a telescope that's, you know, a little bit more advanced than manual control, is it's you're fighting your gear all the time. Yeah. So you guys just, got just, that? Yeah. 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 Okay. So this here, this is the bright star Albireo. And this is in the primary telescope right now at Frosty Drew. Albireo, this is a one of the most popular double star systems we look at in the sky, also known as a binary star system. And this is also the head of Cygnus to Swan in the constellation Cygnus. Now, when you look at this object with your naked eye, you're gonna just see one star in the sky. You're seeing a combination of light from both stars. But with the telescope, it's very easy to see that there are two stars here. Now, something to take note here. And though with the camera, it's not as visible, you will notice that these stars have different sizes and different colors, just slightly different colors. Now, when we say binary star, we usually mean a star system where you have two or more stars that are gravitationally bound to each other. They form a gravitational balance with each other and then there's a center point of gravity that they end up orbiting around. That center point is called a barycenter. So essentially, these stars orbit each other. Now, in the case of Albireo, these stars are very close to each other, but not necessarily close enough to... You're going to see me killing mosquitoes. Sorry, I'm a murderer. But the, these stars are not necessarily close enough to form a gravitational center point, but they could. And... It's been a question for a long time if these stars actually are true binaries or if they just happen to be close enough to each other that from our point of view they look like they're right next to each other, but there's actually too much distance in between. And up until recently, we were kind of leaning towards the idea that they actually were connected and that they did share a common center point of gravity over several light years of space. But recent data from the European Space Agency's Gaia mission has shown us that a very important part of determining a true binary status is called proper motion, and that's the motion of stars in the galaxy. If these stars were together, their proper motions would match, but Gaia has identified that they actually have separate or unmatching proper motion, which would imply that they're actually not connected. So we would call this an optical binary. Now that's not a closed door. There's still a lot of debate on this, but as of right now, it's definitely leaning towards an optical binary. But some of the differences you see here, so these colors that you're seeing, the colors are the temperature of the stars. Blue stars are the hot stars and red stars are the cool stars. When you are observing these stars, once you identify those temperatures, you get a pretty good idea of the mass of the stars. To get a star to become blue, you need to have a substantially high amount of mass to get temperatures up that high. And that kind of yellowish orange star, in this case it looks just white, but it's actually more like a yellow orange. Though it looks bigger, it's a lower mass star. And it's, though it's much brighter than the sun, it is similar in mass to the sun. Now, these stars are something we look at all summer long. They're visible in the summer triangle. And I would highly recommend a visit to Frosty Drew to actually observe these stars over the summer. Now, while I have presentation control, 
Let's see if we could get a few other objects. What do you say? Give it a try. See what happens. So, I'm going to swing over real quick here and see if I can't get a view of a star called um, the Double Double. Now, the Double Double, this is a star that is another binary. It's known as Epsilon Leary. It's in the constellation Lyra. And this is, I'll explain to you when we get there. How about that? So I'm going to move the telescope with you guys connected. Let's see what happens. Whee, star trails. <laughs> yeah, you notice that it's like bright in the center and dark on the edges. That's called vignetting. Vignetting is not a very good thing. There it is. So this is a double-double. Now, at this magnification, you see what looks like binary system, right? Two stars. Now, it is important to note that this is everything you're going to see in this is true binary. Now, you see two stars here, but if we get close enough to this, we should be able to break out these stars into individual stars. So let's see if we can adjust our focus just a little bit here and see if we can make that kind of happen. We'll try to. We'll also see if we can not bring down some of our... Little, some of our... Uh, the aperture here. Like the uh, shutter speed, so we can get to a little slower, maybe. Even ISO. Can we get to go this a little might, bit lower? This might be an obvious question, but why do you call it a double bubble? So, and I'm not sure if we're going to see it on the camera here. We're trying to get it in focus, but it just might be a little bit too bright. But what it's the reason it's called a double double is because each of the stars that you saw initially there, each of these stars is actually a binary system in itself. And I'm trying, I'm hopefully trying to be able to get us to see all individual stars. And now, what's really cool about that one is one of the binaries is, or the, the two binary pairs are basically 90 degrees to each other. So you see like two go across and then two go 90 degrees to that. So when you, when it, when it does split, um, which is the term that we use uh, when looking at binaries, it's really spectacular because you see um the two stars it it'll it'll split into four and then you get two that separate you know across the frame one way and then the other two separate across the frame the other way um it's pretty pretty spectacular visually when you see that uh at least i think so um and it doesn't require a a, a large instrument to do this um visually it probably requires quite a large instrument to do it with the camera uh, because the camera has the whole illumination thing going on. I'll try to get it back in one second. Dark table just yeah, I tried, I tried doing this one with my telescope the other night as well, Scott, and it just didn't well, work. It usually works well for me. I just don't do it enough to always remember it. So uh, okay. that's what happens. It, it, and you can't, I can't be mixing different controls at the same time. That's kind of where the problem is here. And, um, but I'm trying to get as much as I can with it by actually manual. So turn this on here. I don't want it set to auto though. I don't know why I keep saying auto. So we're gonna kind of skip that. Now I'm going right back to the live view. Yeah, so I can't fully get these to discern individually. If you look at the star on the right hand side here, this one down over here, the bottom right, you'll actually notice that you lost it is your life. somewhat elongated. I'm not, yeah, I still got to bring it up. Hang on a second. <laughs> Here we go. We have an interesting uh, queue of individuals gathering outside that are confused about why you need tickets. <laughs> they seem to have forgot that, you know, COVID-19 is happening. <laughs> right. <laughs> so oh, yeah, you, now you it's elongation. Now it's up. So that's, that's exactly it there. Thank you. Um, on the, especially on the bottom right star, this guy right over here, you'll notice that the star looks kind of oval. 
And the reason it looks oval is because there's two stars right there, right next to each other. Now, when you can make this, and the same thing here, this star looks slightly oval in this angle as well. And what's happening here is each of these systems, so these two stars you see on the screen right here, both of these systems are comprised of two stars individually. And in each system, both of those stars form a Barry center, a gravitational center point, and they orbit around each other. But then the two star systems also form a gravitational center point, and they orbit around each other as well. And that's why it's called a double-double. And this is a good example of how, it's not necessarily chaotic, but how diverse these binary systems can actually get. I mean, it's really quite fascinating at the amount of stuff that's going on here. Now, it's a little, let me do this. Derek, why don't you throw up an image real quick, and I'm going to try for my next target, all right? All right. Sound good? Um, yeah. Or if Gavin great. has something to show as well. Um, I'm actually very interested to see what Derek's last image was there. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I added one since Scott went to Alberio. Um, I added a, a processed image of Alberio just to kind of give you a better idea for what that looks like because um, we saw a lot of camera artifacts going on with um, Scott's live view. Um, but this is the star Alberio. And you can see, you know, the orange star and the blue star that Scott was talking about um, up against that background of Milky Way stars because um, Alberio is the head of the swan. Um, and the swan is basically parallel to the plane of the Milky Way. So the, that head, that Alberio is, you know, within the plane of the Milky Way. So you see a lot of background stars. Um, so my, the last image I had selected for tonight is uh, the Cocoon Nebula. Um, this is something that um, is outside of the Summer Triangle, but it's it's just to the east of the Neb. Um, it's still along the Milky Way, um, kind of along maybe if you drew, a, if you know the Deneb's wings, or sorry, Cygnus's wings, um, it's probably the distance um, between the two primary uh, wing stars to the east of Deneb. Um, this is, you know, you can see this dark nebula, and I need to get more data to really bring this out, but you can see this dark nebula that's blocking the starlight um, behind the nebula, and then you've got this part of the nebula here that is illuminated by the stars within it. And that, you know, we see, it kind of makes a cocoon, thus the name, the Cocoon Nebula. Um, hopefully I can get some more data and really show how the dark nebula stands out from the field of stars behind it. And you can really see the density of stars uh, in this field of view. You know, this is, this is deep within um, the Milky Way plane and it's just stars everywhere um for this one and this one isn't on the messier list that we commonly use and talk about at frosty drew uh it's not even well it's probably on the ngc list um but it's it's known by its uh ic designation uh, if you want to go look it up it's 5146 oops uh, but you can really kind of see you know some nice structure in this nebula um, and when you look at this one with um a telescope you have to use a fairly large telescope to be able to see um, this object, it is really it is quite dim. Um, it is much dimmer than the Ring Nebula. It's much dimmer than M27, the Dumbbell Nebula, and it's it's probably on par with some of the galaxies that I showed earlier tonight. In that you'll see that there's something there, um, but you really won't see any structure visually unless you're using um, a fairly large telescope. Um, and you can see over here, this star is lighting up or illuminating some of that dark nebula um, over here. So, this is fabulous, Derek. That's a that's an amazing capture right there. Now, was this you captured this this just past week, huh? Yeah, it was three days ago. Now, do you have clear night, clear skies every night? Um, this week was really good, actually. Um, surprisingly, uh, that's I had amazing. A few a few times at sunset, it got pretty muddy uh, or just murky, and it was kind of unusable. And I let it sit for about an hour and then went back out. Um, I have um, a live image of the ring if you guys want it. Yeah, let's take a look. Take a look at that. 
So right now we have, Derek was showing this earlier. This is Messier 57, the Ring Nebula. Now, granted, it's not, we're still in twilight here. So all that purple you're seeing in your view, what you're looking at right there, that's the twilight sky. I mean, it is not nighttime yet, and this is a deep sky object. But you'll notice that right in the center of the image here, you have the Ring Nebula. You'll notice that there is a it's somewhat blue towards the inside of the ring, and it's red on the outside of the ring. And this is this is live right now in the front of your telescope. Now, as it gets darker tonight, all of this purple you see in the field is going to disappear, and the nebula will get brighter and brighter as the night goes on. Now, I don't have a filter on the telescope right now, which is why we're getting all the light. But this is this object is about maybe 2,600 light years distant. And this is, you're looking at stellar demise as Derek was describing earlier. I mean, when, when you look out at the sky, you see a lot of stuff, but we see these types of nebulae everywhere. And though it's called a nebula because you actually have gas that's being ionized by the ultraviolet radiation coming off the core of that star, overall, it's better to describe these as a transitionary white dwarf or the very beginning stages of a white dwarf because that's what's actually forming right here. This is a white dwarf star that's, that's actually forming. And it forms from the death of like stars that are, that are lower mass. And I don't wanna say low mass stars because 97% of all stars in the galaxy are going to end this way. So it's not just low mass stars, it's the majority of all the stars in the galaxy. But this really is a, an excellent view. I'm going to do another quick exposure on it real fast for you here and see if we can't, because you know, even by the moment, we lose more and more of that, of that twilight view. But this really is, a, this is one of the targets that it's funny. We, we were talking earlier tonight about how, or not tonight, but other, over other weeks and among the team about sometimes it's hard to see a lot of deep sky objects and you don't think that it's gonna be a good night and you take a look and then all of a sudden these objects just pop out in the field. The Ring Nebula is one of the objects that this telescope down at Frosty Drew does super good. Like it gives us a fantastic view of it. And though the camera gives us a wider field view, we can put a lot of magnification and really blow up the, view, the field of view and get that ring almost to fill up the, a good chunk of the field. And on the on best nights, you can actually see that central star, that white dwarf inside the center of this ring. So like, this is a summertime object. We're gonna be looking at this all summer. So again, the, the, those are the nights to be down here. Now at this moment, the more I'm looking at the sky, it's still pretty clear out there. But if we open tonight, we would have been a half hour in and we're gonna base tomorrow nights estimation on how things work tonight because tomorrow night's forecast is very similar. So Derek, you have something else you want to show or do you want me to go to something else? Uh, I got, I'm through the list of things that I had selected for tonight. So if um, we have questions or if you've got a couple other things to look at. I thought it was Gavin's turn. Yeah, Gavin, what do you got going on over here? <laughs> um, I don't know anything recent. Um, I was like, the target I'm currently working on is uh, M101, which Derek had an excellent photo of earlier. Um, I do have some stuff from the winter I can pull up. Yeah, give us some love, Gavin. Um, so what we have here is uh, the Pleiades, uh, which is a uh, open star cluster uh, that you'll see in the fall uh, into the winter. Um, so what this is, it's a group of stars that all kind of form at the same time out of the same big cloud of gas. Um, and you can kind of see some wisps of that cloud of gas uh, still there being lit up by the stars. Um, it didn't quite make it to star uh, material, but uh, it still gets a bit of a show. Um, now this object's kind of cool because it is so huge that you can see it without a telescope or binoculars or anything. Um, you'll see what looks like this weird little uh, chunk of stars that just they're real close together and all really bright um, and just kind of look, you'll know it when you see it. Uh, it's this uh, very interesting object. 
Yeah, the Pleiades is excellent. What's interesting about the Pleiades too here, Gavin, is that you know you see this the nebula around these the stars that are in the cluster, and for a while we were we wondered is this the nebula that these stars formed from? I mean, an open star cluster like this is the second stage of star formation as we see it today, and for a while we wondered is this some of that residual gas? But it's actually not in this case. This is just another hydrogen gas cloud that is moving through the cluster. And these are the type of events that aid in the breaking up of the cluster. So, I mean, this capture is, is excellent. I mean, you're capturing all of that awesome stuff that's going on. Next up here, we have uh, another nebula. This is the. Uh... Derek earlier said the Kuhn Nebula is a dark nebula and a light nebula together. This is the, um, uh, what's it called here? Alnitak is one of the stars in Orion's belt and there's this cloud of uh, bright hydrogen gas coming off, but then in front of the cloud, um, in the same uh, region of gas and dust, we have a uh, cloud of dust here that blocks off and kind of makes this little uh, horse head that gives the nebula its name. Um, so where you've got this extremely hot gas back here that's glowing with its own light, uh, we also have this uh, darker material. Uh, there's so much stuff going on uh, in the Orion cloud there. Yeah, that's that's an amazing image, Gavin. Now you captured this. This is what band is this? Uh, this oh, is wavelength. all the hydrogen alpha wavelength. Um, so it's a, a very specific emission line of the um, ionized hydrogen gas. Yeah, hydrogen alpha. That's right at the, that's right at the edge of the visible red spectrum before we start dropping into near IR. It's difficult for, for human eyes to see it. We can see it, but it's so dim to us that all other light tends to overpower it. But that is just an, that is an amazing image. Now, what, what are some of the, so you got your stars in your field, you got Alan attack there, and then around the stars, you have what seems to be a secondary halo. What is that? Yeah, so that's a consequence of the instrument that I'm using. You might have seen in Derek's picture of Alvirio, he had a cross going through the stars. Um, and that's because his telescope uses a pair of mirrors to magnify the image. Um, and one of the mirrors has to be held up by structure of the telescope, and you're seeing, that's the cross that you're seeing. Um, the telescope I use for this image is a refracting telescope. It's kind of like a camera, where we're looking through lenses like a, a regular camera would. Um, so instead of, uh, seeing the mirror support structure, what you're seeing there is a reflection of the outer edge of the telescope. Um, because that star is so bright, um, the different circular elements throughout the uh, uh, telescope are kind of show up in the final image. Now is that, do you only see that when you're doing post-processing or is it pretty much all the time? Um, you'd see it live if you um, things were sufficiently bright. Um, Visually, it would probably be something you shouldn't be looking at if you start to see something like that. <laughs> um, but these artifacts can be helpful in calibrating the telescope as well. You can see that the halos are a little bit off center. And what that means is that my camera and everything is not quite aligned with the telescope. So it's still producing an image, but it could be better if I took the time to line everything up, make sure everything was concentric. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, I love depending that. Depending on your telescope's design, there's a lot of these little tricks you can use where you're essentially taking a picture of your telescope um, instead of taking a picture of the sky to um, very precisely align everything. Yeah. The star test. Um, so that's what I've got. I, if Scott has moved on to something uh, interesting, the large scoop. I've got, give me one second. I'm going to try to bring up a triple star called. Omicron Cygni, but I'm going to have to move the dome before I do it. I'm just trying to, there we go. All right, now let me get the dome moved, all right? I'll put it up on the screen, though, and I'll leave the microphone on so you can hear the dome moving, so you can, you know, kind of pretend you're here. I was going to say, Sounds people good. might like that. Yeah, <laughs> you'll, you'll hear it. All right, I'll be right back.
There it goes. Okay. So now we have <laughs> the dome moved and the lights turned down a bit. And what we're looking at here, this is a system called Omicron Cygni. And let's try to, yeah, even when we zoom in, we're going to miss out on most of it. So Omicron Cygni is, a, it's what we call a triple star system, but it's an optical triple. Now, some of the stars in this system are in fact actually connected to each other, but not the ones you see here. This primary star in the center is actually connected to another star that's outside of the field. In the case of these three stars, they are just, they're all in the same line of sight. So this is considered an optical triple star system. But at this distance from each star visually, they start to contrast each other and you can see the colors more. Now again, tonight with the, the cameras, doesn't capture the colors in real time. I mean, we're looking at this real time. I smacked the telescope, you can see it's shaking. The, don't smack the telescope either, by the way. And <laughs> in this case, you'll notice that the star in the middle is a bit more yellow. The star up here is a bit more blue and this star here is quite blue. And when, when you look at the sky, you see all of these points of light on a black background, pinpoints. So you see white stars on the, the darkness of space, but that's not the truth. In reality, all these stars are very colorful, but they're just so bright and they're so small against that, that background that we just see them as, as white. But every once in a while, when you get something colorful that moves in the sky, say something like Mars, and when you see Mars in the sky, it looks kind of pink, whitish pink, some of whitish orange, but Mars moves quite a distance across the sky as we orbit the sun and then it's orbiting the sun and how the view of the background stars appear to it. And Mars will orbit very closely to stars along the ecliptic and two specific stars, either Sirius, I'm not sorry, not Sirius, either Spica or the star Regulus in Leo. Both of these stars are high mass stars. They're quite blue. And when you look at them in the sky, they look a little blue. But when Mars gets within one degree of each of these stars, they start to look like a sapphire and a ruby in the sky because their colors are contrasting each other and it gives our eye and our brain something to compare it to. And I see so many visitors come out and I look at it and I say, what is this? What is going on here? And then over the next couple of days, as they start to move apart again, they start going back to you know kind of blue and kind of pink. When we look at binary stars or triple star systems or even optical binary systems like this one, you can actually see those colors contrasting each other. And it's a really fabulous view. This is in the constellation Cygnus. This is just off to the side of the bright star Deneb, which is uh, the tail feathers of Cygnus the Swan. These are actually part of the wing stars. And this is an object that we also look at quite frequently here during the summer. Now, if you permit me one more, I know we're over our time, but we scheduled ahead tonight so we can try to go over our time if we wanted to. I'm going to try real quick to get one of my favorite binary star systems. It's called 61 Cygni. And 61 Cygni is it's important for a couple reasons. First of all, it's a true binary system. Whoop, off it goes. But also, 61 Cygni is very close to us. This star system is about 11.4 light years distant. And that's like when we, when we talk about the galaxy, when we're talking about like, that's like our galactic front doormat. Like that's right outside the door for us. Now I'm gonna see if I can improve the focus just a little bit here because it's low on the horizon right now. And because it's low like this, the focus is gonna go in and out a little bit. So let's see what we can do. See if I can work a little magic here, probably not, but the, so what happens with these stars is these stars are very similar in brightness and in mass to the sun. So the sun is what we call a G-type star, which is um, our spectral classification. The scale is O, B, A, F, G, K, M. These stars here are K-type stars. So they're slightly cooler than the sun. But 61 Cygni has one very interesting property about it. 
and it is that 61 Cygni has a very fast proper motion. Now, I remember we were talking about proper motion before, which is the motion of stars in a galaxy, right? Most stars, you, don't, you won't notice their motion. Over decades, you won't see that change. Very strong, very sensitive, very precise instrumentation may be able to notice it, but as people just look at the sky or looking in the space, you don't notice it. Over hundreds of thousands of years, the starscape will change quite dramatically. Except for 61 Cygni. 61 Cygni moves so fast that you can actually visibly see position changes over a decade. And because of that super fast motion, which was identified by an Italian astronomer named uh, Piazzi, this star is sometimes referred to as Piazzi's flying star. Now, like I said, it's very low on the horizon right now. The telescope's looking just over the trees. And that's why the stars look blurry. That's why they look like they're moving around a lot. And it's because of the amount of atmosphere we got to look through down on the horizon is substantially greater than what you see looking up to the sky. So that atmosphere you know, refracts light, bends the light, and it messes up our focus points, constantly changing. So the stars stay out of focus. You also notice that at the very bottom of the stars, you got a little bit of red. And on the very top edge of the stars, you got a little bit of blue. And what you're looking at there is called atmospheric dispersion. The stars are low enough on the horizon that the blue and the red focal points are no longer at the same place. And the telescope can't figure out which ones to be focusing on. So we're just kind of focusing in the middle. So we see a little bit of the red out of focus and a little bit of blue out of focus. And in the middle, you get like that blob of relative whiteness where the colors are coming together. As this star gets higher in the sky, those problems go away. It's something to think about. So this is the, the last live object I have for you right now. We still have another hour to go before we're out of astronomical twilight or about 50 minutes. And that's when the sky really opens up. Though as of right now, though I am looking relatively north, the sky is still pretty clear here tonight. And I'm just gonna say it, we debated heavily on the prospect of opening tonight. And there was definitely a lot of, you know, throwing things around and yelling and screaming and a lot of stress went into the idea of canceling tonight. And I said, I'm gonna come down here tonight and if it's clear, then we're gonna take this into consideration, but starting next week, we are going to open on the same schedule that we would normally have opened, not necessarily in time slot, but on principle that if it's cloudy, we're still open. Now, I just wanna let you guys know something that's very important is the way we're getting access to work on site right now is we're using a temporary ticketing mechanism. This is not permanent. This is only gonna stay around as long as we need to keep it around to be compliant with some of the changes that we have to do for the current global lockdown. Now, I know you guys have probably heard that statement almost like it's a scapegoat or a blanket statement to anything that's not right. And I agree with it, it's very frustrating. But as it is right now, this is what it is. So the ticketing system works. There are donations you're making. You're not purchasing tickets. Our program on Friday nights will always be a free program with a suggested donation. The platform we're using may not allow you to grab a ticket for nothing. I think $1 may be the lowest you can actually get a ticket for. Because these are donations, your tickets are non-refundable. This is why we've been reserving the amount of time that we put those ticket links up so people aren't buying tickets today for an event two weeks down the road that ends up having a hurricane or something. We wanna make sure you guys have the best chance of actually being able to come out and see something. Now, just please understand that if you do buy tickets or, or acquire tickets for a donation and it ends up being cloudy that night, there's nothing we can do about that. We do our best to predict the weather, but our predictions are based on what everyone else is predicting. And I feel like in New England, and I may get chided by some of my meteorology friends for saying this, but I do feel like in New England, we know today's forecast tomorrow. So, but if you guys wanna visit, that's the way to do it. And just, again, thank you for all the patience you guys have shown us. I mean, this has been a, a stressful time for us. We, we understand it is frustrating for you guys as well. We've definitely received some interesting feedback from people. Some people are very frustrated with what's going on and I, I agree with them, but we're not complaining about it. If you guys 
by you guys submitting feedback, whether it's frustrations or props, or I mean, we love the props, but we like the frustrations as well because this lets us know how all of you feel about what we're doing. And it allows us to kind of identify issues. And another thing to say is that it takes us months, months of designing, development, planning, testing, before we even get our events on the calendar. And then we get them on the calendar right around Christmas time for the whole next year. So a lot of time goes into planning our events. Right now, we're redesigning our events on the fly, just like everybody else is. I mean, it's just not us that has this problem. So there are a lot of issues that we're running into that we are overlooking. And your feedback helps us with that. And we apologize for the issues that we are, the, the ones that we actually could fix. But there are other ones that are just out of our control that we just got to deal with. So tomorrow night is our Celebrate the Milky Way event. It's our second one for the year. I really want to be open for this event. This event historically has brought out hundreds of people to the campus. That is not going to be able to happen tomorrow. We are going to post a ticket link tomorrow morning if the forecast holds for what it was saying today. And we will be giving out 45 tickets for the event. If you don't get a ticket, please don't just show up. There's nothing you're going to be able to tell us that we're just going to say, okay, you can get in. 45 is our cutoff. That's just how it is. And we will be offering additional Milky Way viewing nights. We have two scheduled for July. We have one scheduled for August. Phase two in Rhode Island is scheduled for an evaluation at the end of the month. If we move into phase three this July, we may be able to accommodate many more people at our events. But thank you for sticking around. Thank you for your patience, for your donations, and thank you for you know supporting us through this time and outside of it now that girl on the bottom you see there that's mara i want you to keep an eye on her mara is going to be doing amazing things with us this summer and you're going to be seeing her work throughout the year even after her internship's done we're going to continue to to show you guys the stuff she did and talk about it so come on out on friday nights we also have some new team members that we'll be introducing over the next couple of weeks and it looks like we're going to have a really great summer so if you guys learned anything great tonight, if you guys had a fun time, or if you're just feeling like you want to help us out, then please visit us online, frostydrew.org slash donate, and make a donation. We are now in our full out tourism season. This is the time of the year that we bring in as much donations as we can to, make, to get us to stretch through the summertime, or through the off season, which runs largely through the winter and through the spring. And we're not having events right now. It makes it very difficult for us to be able to budget correctly. So any donation you guys can make is works perfectly for us, and it, we thank you so much for it. So thank you very much for, for tuning in tonight, and we hope to see you out tomorrow night and possibly even during the next couple weeks on Friday nights here at the observatory as we slowly move back to a period where we actually can be doing live events on site. So we'll see you guys all later. Just so you able to stop the live feed. I got it, never mind. Okay, we're off. <laughs>